So let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this new day, and we thank you that we can gather today and um, take a look at the book of Romans. We pray, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our heart, and you would guide us, and um, give us your peace. So we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Just a, just a little program note, uh, we were, Rick and I were talking today about bringing in internet people, but I wasn't confident we had it all worked out. Rick has a slightly different idea from, from what I have, and so next week we might try that. So if you're watching this class live, it's possible, I'm not guaranteeing it, it's possible that next week, um, Rick, like we do in our live streams on a bunch of our channels, Rick would put a little link in there, and so you could join the live stream and participate in the class. So that's what we're up to. All right, um, this might be the last week on chapter six. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But the well, let's let's go all the way back to let's go all the way back to the beginning of what we talked about when we opened the book. What is, if anybody remembers, what is the great puzzle? What is the great puzzle? It's almost the most basic question about human existence. Right now I'm sitting here and I'm looking out that window and there's a, the blossoms are on this beautiful tree that's right on the street and the tree looks absolutely beautiful. And it's cloudy today, but it's March, so very quickly in California, we're going to have bright blue skies and temperatures in the upper 60s or low 70s. And people are going to go to a place like Yosemite, and the falls are going to be glorious. And But right now, you've got people who are worried because all of that water is coming through the foothills, and we're going to get more water. and there are rock slides on Highway 1, this absolutely glorious roadway. So what's the great puzzle? Okay, and it's, it's, it's even to the effect that how can this world be, on one hand, a place of such amazing beauty and glory and joy, um, and at the same time, a place of absolutely gut-wrenching disaster. And I think in the contemporary frame, we tend to look outwards with this. In the ancient world, I think they're a little bit more honest in noting that we participate in the mess. <laughs> And we are responsible often for the mess. And ironically, oftentimes the mess comes as a direct result of our attempts to remediate past messes. And so the book is the book of Romans, you know, very much in a Hebrew conceptualization, but not exclusively to the Hebrews, talks about sin. And last week, Sin is a very broad term. It basically means mark missing, which in some ways gets at the great puzzle because we would, part of us thinks that every moment of our life should be one experience of rapturous joy after another with each new moment surpassing the former. Now, if you hear that, you might think a drug addict would, <laughs> would imagine the world to be like this. Because in some ways, that's exactly what happens with, I've never done heroin, but people tell me the first hit of heroin is amazing. And every other time you go back to heroin, you're trying to get at that first hit. I've never done cocaine, but people tell me your first trip on cocaine is amazing, and every other time you get on crack or cocaine, you're trying to recapture that first high. And I'll just take them at their word. I have no desire to experiment. 
And now we have a medical doctor with us today. And, and so what I hear from some people is that part of what these drugs do is just blow out some of the, pre the pleasure sensors of our mind. And because of something that has to do with brain chemistry and neurons, I don't understand any of that. You sort of expend, you, you, you can't get back to that max again. You, you, you basically hit a, hit a biochemical limit. And, you know, ancients had much more of a sense of life has a degree of balance where there are good times and bad times. And, and you can say that and it's almost cliche, especially when bad times can be so remarkably awful. And you, we almost sometimes, sometimes we see something and we think things couldn't get any worse and then they do. And so part of the definition of sin is mark missing. And um, I watched a very interesting conversation between a couple of a pastor and a couple of other really smart guys. And um, limitation comes into this conversation in some ways because part of what we struggle with is our limitation. And we don't, these, these categories are so difficult to continue to corral because limitation isn't necessarily sin. Yet, failing to reach potential can be sin because there's an obligation. Potential has within it a certain degree of obligation. So mark missing is one definition of sin. Another is rebellion. And if, we, if you think about the story of Genesis 3, the man and the woman are in the garden. They are limited creatures. They are limited beings. And we know that because there's a potential that's in the garden, that's in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they have not arrived at. And via the temptation of the serpent, they see that potential. They desire that potential, but there's a prohibition between them and that potential. And the serpent comes and not only, um, points out the prohibition, but undermines the reputation of God in order to prompt them to transgress beyond the prohibition and live in, you know, take an act of rebellion to eat the fruit. So, and that's different from Mark missing. That's different from just, you know, you have a, you give a, a five-year-old, a basketball, and you say, make the shot. And that five-year-old is going to really struggle. Uh-oh, um, maybe Rod just come to try and fix the gutter. Um, yeah, he's looking at the gutter. Um, maybe my, am I on, is my sound level good, Rick? Okay. Um, so, anything wrong, Raj? Let Mike a little closer. Okay. I saw you coming and I thought, must be a problem. All right. That's always easier to turn me down than to turn me up. Okay, thanks, Rick. The five-year-old can't hit the basket and we're not upset by that because he's a five-year-old and he's limited. That's, that's not a moral transgression. Rebellion is clearly a moral transgression. Exactly. A two-year-old is capable of rebelling in a way that a six-month-old is not. So I've heard a number of people say, the six-month-old is always right. Why? Because they're just six months old. They don't have the capacity to rebel. The, you know, a dog, a well-trained dog, is that rebellion? Boy, it's a gray area. But the, the tiger eating the village goat is not rebellion. And, and then we get into this third level, which is corruption, which is, if you look at the heroin addict or the cocaine addict, it 
you know, they were living in limitation. They wandered into rebellion. And now the addict is in the squalor of corruption. They have, in some ways, taken what was good, and by virtue of repeated rebellion, wound up in corruption and may no longer reach potential because they have undermined what ought to have been their agency through repeated rebellion. That's a way to understand corruption. Okay. Now, if we, if we look at the argument in chapter, in chapter 5, Paul makes an argument that there's something glorious about Christ. There, there's a certain additional glory because something had to be surmounted. In almost every story that we have, there's, there's sort of a, a, a beginning state, and there's a problem, and there's an end state. And sometimes the end state is lower than the beginning state. Sometime it's sort of a return to the beginning state, and sometime it's a greater state than either the beginning state or a state of loss. And, and stories always modulate between these sorts of things, and it's not always easy to tell. For example, we can talk about, let's, let's imagine, I'll just make up this hypothetical story that no one in the world could possibly relate to. Let's imagine a novel virus came into the world that none of the human population was ever <laughs> exposed to. And because it was a novel virus, none of us had the immunological response previously coded by past generations or in within our own lifetime to, follow, to fight this. And so a lot of people die and, you know, people try to develop vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. Because of such a novel virus, today, I would guess immunologists, um, epidemiologists, and medical doctors know more about the human immune system, about epidemics, about coronaviruses, about spike proteins than we ever knew before. So, here's the question. Was COVID a good thing? That's a really hard question to answer because on one hand, if COVID took out your grandma, COVID was not a good thing. If maybe grandma was healthy and doing well. Maybe if your grandma wasn't doing well, COVID brought grandma kind of a peaceful death. So, for some people, it, this is part of the complexity of human life. And Paul points out in chapter 5 that sin now being addressed by Christ has yielded something which is amazing, something which is great. And in fact, in another part of Scripture, Paul talks about the fact that there's this, there's this word in scripture, epithumia, where, which is usually over-desire, and usually that's sort of a bad thing. Paul uses that with respect to the angels that they can't get enough of focusing on the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ because it's such a great story that what seemed like a calamity in the history of the world, which was sin, mark missing, rebellion, and corruption, by the work of Christ, something even greater than sin has been accomplished. And, and that shouldn't be a, too difficult a thing for us to imagine. So. In our little corner of the internet, we have a guy named Chad the Alcoholic. And Chad the Alcoholic often shows up with a, a Lucha Libre mask on. 
because he goes to Alcoholics Anonymous. And Chad the Alcoholic is, um, continues to work his recovery through AA. And if you talk to Chad about his alcoholism, it's kind of complex. Because on one hand, he, his alcohol addiction brought him to depths that he wouldn't wish on his worst enemy. And he knows that because he lived that. All of that loss, all of that loathing, all of that corruption, all of the damage he did to his body, to his life, to his relationships. He goes into, he goes into AA and he doesn't just turn his life over to a higher power, but if you fall, fall through the steps of AA, you start making amends and you start having to go back to people as long as it doesn't hurt them. You have to go back to people and you have to admit. Now, it, one thing to do would be to give an excuse to say, well, I was an alcoholic, so I wasn't really in control. No, that's not what you do. <laughs> You'll go back and say, I was drinking too much. It's a very subtle dance. What I, how I hurt you is on me, and I'm sorry, and I want to make amends. There's something beautiful about that story than that that couldn't that beauty could never be seen without the hurt and this world is like that too and so in 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 Romans chapter 5 Paul points this out and says with all of the sin Christ has created a story now which is even more beautiful than a story of innocence. And if you hear that, one might say, well, if that's true, shouldn't we keep sinning so that even greater stories can be told? And Paul in Romans 6 has to address that. It's not a dumb argument, but it's not, it, it, it's not impossible to see that, okay, that's true, but that's not really the way we should go. And he begins that at the beginning of, of chapter 6. What, therefore, shall we say? Shall we continue to sin in order that grace may increase? There's the argument. Um, Oh, here it is. Sometimes Microsoft changes things on me. Um, there's the argument. May it never be. Paul says, no way. Meganoita. It's a very strong Greek term. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Huh. Now, part of what we have to deal with Paul often is that Paul talks in, let's talk about eschatology. There's a fancy theological word. Anybody know what I mean by eschatology? End times, yes. It's not, and, and because it's the last things. Part of eschatology talks about and this word is in, it's in Greek, it's telos. Um, and in English, um, finish sometimes can mean sort of termination. It can also mean goal. And eschatology has this dual nuance of not only end, but goal. The Shorter Westminster Confession begins with, what is the chief end of man? Now, someone could say death. Okay. But the chief end of man is to love God and glorify him forever. Now, they're obviously not talking about simply a terminus. 
they're talking about a goal, a destination. And so when we talk about eschatology, we talk about a goal and destination. So Paul here says, how can it, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And this is where, as we talked in the last few weeks about baptism, this is where we get into this argument. Because um, eschatology, theologically, often there's a term that's called realized eschatology, and the idea is now and not yet. And both of these things live we are, we are in both of them now. And when you hear that now and not yet, you say, you can't both be in now and not yet because they mean different things. And so when Paul says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? He is saying, well, we are dead to sin. Here's the problem. When I look at my life, and when I look at Mark missing, and rebellion, and corruption, those things aren't fully dead to me. Hopefully, they're more dead to me than they were. And again, I think part of the reason that 12-step programs have become so powerful, it's because in a 12-step program, if you ask them, they say, I am in recovery. I am still an alcoholic. And you might say, well, why would you? So, so I could talk to my friend Chad and say, Chad, how can you say you're still an alcoholic when you don't drink anymore? And he, would, he might say something like, well, I still have the potential to drink and I feel that every day. I still have the desire to drink and I feel that every day. I still wrestle with drinking, and I feel that every day. And so when you look at this eschatological re, um, reality, AA sort of, sort of balances this by saying, I'm in recovery. And what he says, what's that saying is, um, I am not drinking, so I am dead to alcohol but I am still prone to addiction. So I have known a number of people in recovery at one level or another, and whereas many of them are not drinking, sometimes they're overeating, sometimes they're collecting, sometimes, in other words, there's, there's an aspect to them of addiction, but fortunately, hopefully, they're wrestling with other kinds of smaller addiction, which is like most of us do. There's the chocolate cake. Does Paul Vanderclay really need a piece of chocolate cake? If I never eat another piece of chocolate cake as long as I live, I will not keel over. In fact, my doctor would probably say, Paul, it wouldn't be a bad thing if you ever never ate another piece of chocolate cake as long as you live. But actually, it's much more the ice cream sandwich that has me. Chocolate cake, I can, that ice cream sandwich, boy, that, that cake and ice cream together, that cookie and cold, and oh, that just does me in. But all of this going on, and so Paul in chapter 6 and for the last number of weeks, we talked about baptism. We talked about earlier, uh, we died with Christ. We rose with Christ. He keeps making this argument that he's saying, you are dead to sin. And we say, I don't feel dead to sin. If you ask the people around me, I don't look dead to sin. They, they see my sins more clearly than I do often. And, and, this isn't the only book in which Paul talks this way. He talks this way often. And I just, so I've got Jewish members of my Consciousness Congress here that I am expecting to hear pushback on these points this week because they don't particularly like the Apostle Paul. But, so Paul talks about this in these, early, in these next few verses. Or do you not know that as many has been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we may live a new life. So, so we have this possibility of living without sin, just like the alcoholic has the possibility of living without drink. The, 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 the advantage the alcoholic has, and so many people that I've known who have sort of graduated from AA and often come into the church, as they said, it's unlikely I will ever take up drinking my whole life long. I have, I have not been drinking now for decades, and it really doesn't have a hold on me anymore. But you know what? <laughs> Lots of other things still do. And it, it, it isn't it isn't as necessary for me to focus on alcohol like I once had to 30 years ago. There's whole lots of other things in my life that need to be cleaned up. And I want that new way of life, not just in not drinking, but there is more new life that I want. For we have become identified with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly also we will be identified with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified together with him in order that the body of sin may be done away with and that we may no longer be slaves to sin. Now, this body of sin, boy, part of the difficulty of the book of Romans is I, I really do believe as a preacher I could spend a lifetime of Sundays on just one chapter of this book. Because each one of these words just are gateways into so many more things. For the one who has died has been freed from sin. And we talked about that quite a bit in past weeks because we talked about death and slavery and sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe, see, and this is part of the struggle with the ongoing evolution of language, because I would like to say we trust because trust Belief can be so cognitive, and it's really a whole life trusting that we will also live with him, because that whole life trusting then shapes all of the decisions of our life. Knowing that Christ, because he has been raised from the dead, is going to die no more, death no longer being master over him. Okay, we talked about that two weeks ago and three weeks ago. For that death he died. He died to sin once and never again. But that death he but that life he lives, he lives to God. In other way, in other words, some fundamental translation happened to Jesus Christ from and through his resurrection. And to get at that is no small thing. And it's played out in the story of Jesus and his disciples. He comes back from the dead and they, you know, I, I once told the story, I imagined one day, if my father, who has been dead now 10 years, that's why I was back in Massachusetts, if my father in his flesh rang my front doorbell, and we, we know enough about ourselves psychologically. What would happen to me psychologically? Now, there have been movies recently that have been playing on this where, you know, people come back from the dead. And, you know, we just can't fathom that. And that's exactly what you see in these accounts. And that's part of what's lends authenticity to those accounts because the disciples just don't know what to do with this. And Jesus, although did many amazing things, C.S. Lewis writes about this in his book, Miracles, create, um, you know, creations of the first, you know, before and after the, of the first creation and the second creation. Jesus, his relationship with the disciples is different after the resurrection. He pops in and out. Um, it's him. Thomas can, you know, see the wounds on his hands, see the wound in his side. They know it's Jesus, but I mean, they can't get their mind around it. And the book of Colossians gets into this and talking about, in some ways, the renewal of creation, 
that, that deals not just with rebellion, but also with corruption, decay, and limitation is, is somehow dealt with in, his, in Jesus' resurrection. And that's what Paul talks about here in verse 10. So also you, consider yourselves, consider yourselves. Okay, this is back in, for those of you watching John Verveke, this is in the imaginal. This is this trust that you are to now live into this new reality that we have been talking about. And, and for an alcoholic, what that means is they're living into the new reality of not drinking. Now, now I know that there's been ongoing discussions in communities of recovery as to if you are abstaining from drinking, are you fully recovered? Wouldn't full recovery mean you could drink in moderation? That's a powerful argument. And I'm sure that there are some people who have been through recovery and can now drink in moderation without trouble. That may well be. But you would know that in, a, in an AA group, a conversation like that, Edie shakes her head because she works with clients. <laughs> an AA group would probably say, that's heresy. We are not going to have recovered people drinking in moderation in this group. We are not going to encourage that. Why? Because most people can't do it. Because a whole bunch of people in that group are going to say, oh, I'm... I haven't been drinking for three weeks. I think I got this licked. <laughs> and all of the older guys there are going to say, oh. <laughs> exactly. So this is really difficult. So also you consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So Paul is leading them into, okay, this is how you are to consider yourself. Now, is it recovering or recovered? You're going to have to deal with that. And there's almost no issue in this text that has not been played out in church history. So if you look at the Wesleyan holiness movements in American history, you can find segments of the church that will teach, if you become, you can in this life get beyond sinning. Calvinists, the tradition I'm in, look at that and say, uh, <laughs> we're like the old guys at the AA meeting that when some young guy comes in and say, I've heard that once you're like achieved recovery, then you can probably drink in moderation. And a bunch of the old guys will say, no, I don't know. So this is one of the conversations that goes on in the church. This tradition has tend to, has tend to hold that you will likely continue to be in mark missing rebellion and corruption until the day you die. And then when you look at the question of purgatory, big fight in the Protestant Reformation, there's actually multiple aspects to this. One is the justice of God. Would it, be, would it be just of God to translate you automatically as if there is no debt left to pay for all of the damage you've done in the world? So purgatory as a part of that. More recently, I think a lot of the imagination about purgatory has to be how exactly are we transformed? In other words, sin is so deeply in me, if God can sort of get rid of it at death, can't he get rid of it in any other way? Now, I think you could look at Romans 6 and make the argument that the argument here is that death is the way 
by which we stop sinning. <laughs> That's pretty strong in Romans 6. And Paul is saying now, in a sense, you have to live into your death. Now, now there's, there's a lot of really interesting things going on, conversations going on around psychedelics. And so this is something I never imagined entering into conversation about that class of drugs in Christianity. And now that this movie Jesus Revolution comes out, I've been reading up on that whole scene. It's like, actually, you know, in some ways, the invention of LSD brought this conversation into the late 60s. And we're continuing to deal with it because I have people coming to me now that say, I, I'm a Christian. And part of that path was I did psychedelics and I had some realizations. And an alcoholic could say, yeah, I'm a Christian because I did alcohol and I had some realizations. So this isn't an easy thing to sort of suss out. But part of the argument about psychedelics and about actually a number of ancient religions is that there is a death that happens that is necessary in order to enter into new life. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. We need to die to self and live to Christ. You say that in almost any church, and any church is going to say, well, that's standard Christian theology. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its epithumias. There's the word right there, desires. Do not present your members in, if you look at John 15 and 16, I am the vine, you are the branches. Paul conceives of bodies in very subtle ways that sort of fractal up and down. We are part of the body of Christ and we are its members. I have a body and I have members. Jesus will say sometimes, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Paul is, in a sense, riffing on what Jesus is saying here. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. All right? There's that word again. What is righteousness? I, I always use the same illustration with this over the last six months. The good cop and the bad cop. Righteousness, so epithumia, the corrupt cop. The corrupt cop, why is the co corrupt cop corrupt? One reason might be He's a drug addict. One reason might be he really enjoys the thrill of having power over someone. He's a narcissist. One reason might be he's got a gambling problem and he's in way over his head and his police officer salary can't cover the debts that he has to the mob. And, you know, organized crime is always looking for cops with epithumia because now suddenly, organized crime has a way to corrupt the cops. So that's epithumia is in the corrupt cop. Righteousness is in the good cop. Righteousness says no to epithumia. Righteousness says, boy, yeah, I got a mortgage. I got a car note. Uh, my kids are going into college. As a cop, I'm not making what Bill Gates makes, you know? Um, and someone comes along and says, you know, if you look the other way, I've got an envelope full of cash for you. 
Righteousness says no. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead. That's Paul's argument. And your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will not be master over you because you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, back to chapter five. We talked about the fact that there is something more beautiful about recovery than innocence. That's a really complex thing because there's probably a lot of people in recovery that would really love to have been innocent of all the damage that they have done. But there's also something really beautiful about recovery that somehow there's a greater thing revealed. Now, we talked about law, and we talked about law number one and law number two, and about how you're really blessed to have parents who teach you right from wrong. But there's something really beautiful about the person who learned right from wrong the hard way and became in some ways stronger, better than the person who learned it vicariously. It's part of the reason that in churches it's so popular to have testimonies that someone goes to the front, they lived a horrible life, they were they they were they were hurting people it was horrible but then jesus came into their life and now they're an amazing new purpose, person and in fact in some ways such a person let's say someone grew up in a teetotaling home never had an opportunity to drink never knew the taste of alcohol never knew its joys or its um or its sorrows and another person who's a recovering alcoholic in some ways, the recovering alcoholic is stronger than the innocent person because the innocent person has not been tested by alcohol. Now, it might be that part of the person's alcoholism is because they weren't raised well and they started drinking too young and their environment was horrible. And we've seen you know, these studies done with rats and cocaine, a rat and a a rat in a, in a good environment can taste some cocaine and not become an addict. A rat in an impoverished environment, once they take cocaine, will become an addict. So it might be that the alcoholic became, and this is where it just never ends, the complexity of this, the alcoholic became an alcoholic because of the horrible situation they were raised in. But the innocent person has not yet been tested. And so you have this enormous complexity. And so law on one hand is a good thing that keeps people from sorrow and keeps people from corruption and keeps people from calamity. But Paul notes that law also can enli enliven rebellion. And once you make a law, people sometimes will transgress the law just to transgress the law. And so, Paul says there's kind of a, a back and forth leveling up that goes and Christ keeps winning. And that's where we have the argument from chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. Well, how does this end? It only ends in death when the system is stopped and the roots are cut. But what we see in Christ is that he dies and the good comes out. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Meganoito. There it is again. Do we not know that whoever you, um, do you not know that to whoever you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to whomever you obey, whether leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Okay, so here Paul sets up 
another dichotomy. And it's, it's Bob Dylan, you're going to have to serve somebody. And again, this is very existential. Because Paul looks at someone, let's say the, the drunk, and says, I, I once had an alcoholic come into my office. He was a homeless guy. It was, it was such a poignant moment. He sat down at that table in my office, and he put his can of beer right on my table, and he said, my life is in this can. <laughs> I was speechless. But yet, he died a drunk. He died a drunk. And he managed, you know, he, he was homeless part of the month. And when the rains came, I mean, he painted apartments for a guy who would pay him in cash. That's how he lived his life. But when he put that can on the table and said, my life is in this can, there it was. He was a slave. Now, Paul says, who are you going to serve? Because the can is a terrible master. There is another master who is actually a master who will give you life. Now, this gets into why does Jesus talk about our heavenly father? Now, a parent is in some ways a master over a child. The, the, the parent-child relationship has some commonality with the master-slave relationship. And you find this in societies where there is slavery. But the difference, and it's a world of difference, is usually exploitation. Because the master of the slave lives the master's well-being at the slave's expense. The parent-child lives the child's well-being at the parent's expense. It's an opposite thing. And so Paul here says, you're going to have to serve somebody. And Dylan says, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. But thanks be to God, you were slaves to sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were entrusted, and having been set free from sin, this is Paul's training in righteousness of the gospel, you have been come enslaved to righteousness. Now again, Paul is talking in these now and not yet terms. And this conversation goes throughout the Christian centuries. How free can we get? One of the true ironies of saints in the church is that if you read the lives of like medieval saints, ancient saints, you will often hear them talking about how bound to sin they are. And you might think, hey, wait a minute, but read, read Life of St. Francis. And if you say St. Francis, a lot of people will say, oh, St. Francis, he was a great guy. St. Francis believed himself a horrible sinner. Mother Teresa believed herself a horrible sinner. And you might say, we look at these people as exceptional people. And there seems to be something to the effect that the more exceptional they become, the more aware of the mark missing, the rebellion, and the corruption they also become. In other words, the more holy they get, the more they realize their sin at the same time. And, and you have this with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul at some points will tell his, the churches, do like me, follow me, follow my pattern. And then he'll turn around and say, I am the chief of sinners. And you'd say, if you're the chief of sinners, why do you tell people to follow your example? It's the same thing. Exactly. Follow me as I follow Christ. This Christ is the pattern. And then he says, I'm the chief of sinners. He doesn't say Christ is the chief of sinners. 
Christ is, and this gets really complex, Christ becomes sin. He who knows no sin becomes sin so that we might die. And, and this is where this stuff gets so difficult to follow. Verse 19, the NIV, or not even the NIV, even this translation puts it in parenthetical remarks. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So here, when Paul is saying, you are dead to sin, he is talking on this side. And then when he's saying about the weakness of your flesh, he is talking on this side. So Paul is fully aware of this dichotomy that he's working. And how could he not be? Just read the book of Corinthians. On one hand, Paul tells these people, you are such lousy, <laughs> you're such lousy Christians. Maybe you should stop the whole Eucharist thing because it's so abysmal what you're doing. And then he'll turn around in the same book and tell them that they are new creations in Christ Jesus and they are full of the fruits of the Spirit. For just as you presented your members as slaves to immorality and to lawlessness, read chapter one, leading to lawlessness, it's corruption, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification, becoming holy. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with respect to righteousness. What does that mean? That's corruption. So the cop starts out walking a beat, let's say, alien as he cops and beats. Local drug dealer. Local drug dealer says, I'm going to give you here. Look the other way. Cop looks the other way for the local drug dealer. Goes up a level. Regional, maybe the drug manufacturer. Says here, gives the cop a bigger envelope. Then it's prostitution. Then it's, you know, it just go, goes along the range. Cop does this for 30 years. Young cop comes on the beat and looks at the mentor cop and says, that, that drug dealer just gave me an envelope with $5,000 in it and said, no strings attached. What does the older cop, what did the older corrupt cop say? No big deal. What does the righteous cop say? Don't take that money. He says no strings attached, but you know what? <laughs> you don't even take a bribe. Even if there's no quid pro quo here, this is just a gift. Ah, what Paul's talking about here. Whoops. Um, what happens in corruption? is that you are free from the slave of righteousness. You no longer have a conscience. Therefore, that sort of fruit, did you have then? About which you are now ashamed. In other words, he's saying, there was a time, Romans, in your life when you didn't even have a conscience. You, not, nothing phased you. And again, the saint is a slave to righteousness. Therefore, even what to the rest of the world looks like sins that are so unimportant feel weighty to the saint. But now, having been set free from sin and having been enslaved to God, you have your fruit leading to sanctification and its end it's telos, life eternal. That's where this goes. And this is one road leads to perdition. One road leads to eternal life. What's the opposite of eternal life? Eternal death. For the compensation due to sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Christ Jesus. 
Okay. So, C.S. Lewis used to talk about in our hearts, there's basically a little gate or a sheet of paper. And every day, we're either marking one side or we're marking the other. And that little gate, we're either making it easier to sin every day or we're making it harder to sin every day. Now, on one hand, and this is where the law gets very tricky, because with a law, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Let's look at the second table of the law. You shall not murder. I didn't take out a gun and shoot anyone. I didn't put poison in anyone's food. You shall not commit adultery. I have not found myself in bed with a woman other than my wife. You shall not steal. I'm not broken into houses in the neighborhood and taking their things. You shall not bear false witness. I have not showed up on the stand in court and lied about what's going on in the world. You shall not covet. Suddenly, we have a problem. <laughs> because, and this is some of what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. Because, or with the wealthy young ruler, we look at murder and we say, I've avoided that. How fortunate are you? Adultery. Well, I've avoided that. How fortunate are you? Stealing. Well, I've avoided that. How fortunate are you? Bearing false witness. I've never been, no, no, that's not true. A couple times I've had to give testimony in a legal proceeding. And it was very easy for me to tell the truth. Fortunate is me. But this is hard because this law then can breed in me a certain degree of self-righteousness. And that self-righteousness can lead me to not fully love my neighbor who has not had as fortunate a life as I have. Because raised in a good home, we weren't wealthy, but there was food on the table. Many good things I've been blessed with. Coveting, though? Keep that law. So, the wages of sin is death. And you can become a really egregious sinner by formally keeping a whole bunch of externalities. And Jesus points this out. Now, mind you, I'm not advocating anyone commit murder or commit adultery or steal or bear false witness. It's still better that I have not done any of these things. But let's not be so fooled about the epithumia and the righteousness. Because pride in law keeping can be a really deadly desire. And we're going to have to get into that more. <laughs> and ironically, it's very easy to see how murder and adultery and theft and bearing false witness 
can lead to death. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. That's just a statement about how the world works. It's harder to see how much more subtle forms of sin, sometimes of law keeping, can lead to death. All right. Let's pray. Lord Paul opens up whole ranges of questions for us in this story. And part of what makes us Part of what gives us such capacity for glory gives us tremendous capacity for sin. And this capacity plays out in the great puzzle in the world, where on one hand, human beings can be so absolutely glorious and amazing, and so amazingly cruel and destructive. Help us, Lord, to die to sin and to live to Christ. Help us, Lord, to be slaves of righteousness rather than slaves of our over-desires. Help us, Lord, to grow in Christ, in his resurrected self, and to die to our sin. Hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.